Welcome to the Reggae University, the first session today. Um, my name is Pete Lilly. I'm from Rhythm Magazine from Germany. This is Ellen, also from Rhythm Magazine. And we will be the hosts for today's session along with Pierre Tosi. Um, tomorrow we will be joined by David Katz from England. Um, the Reggae University, um, the reason why we do this is because reggae is so much embedded in the Jamaican culture so that it is our aim to mediate more knowledge of the rich and diverse Jamaican experience. Um, in the next days, we're going to talk about Rasta, dub music, musicianship, the role of female artists in the music business, and so on. Um, and also, since reggae, meanwhile, has become also a European subculture, we will also take a closer look at the development of reggae in the various European countries. But today, we want to get straight to the nitty-gritty and talk about violence in Jamaican culture and its representation in music and movies. Okay, Ellen is going to take over now. Okay, greetings, everybody. As Pete said, you know, my name is Ellen, also from Rhythm Magazine. We're going to host today's session. And, okay, I admit we start with a very harsh issue the issue of violence in Jamaican culture. Uh, we came back from Jamaica mid-June and the murder rate in May was like 200 people got murdered, which is a really, really sad thing. And I think the biggest problem Jamaica is facing today is violence. But violence, of course, has a history. Violence doesn't come out of nowhere, out of the blue. and so we are, I'm very happy that I can introduce my dear friend, Dr. Marlene Kelvin, who is sitting here with the red shirt. And Marlene was born in Hanover, Jamaica, very beautiful countryside, and she moved to Germany in 1989. We both met each other at the university in Düsseldorf, where Marlene studied English and uh, art of history or history art. And Marlene wrote her dissertation on alienation and violence. The correct title is Diasporic Lives, Alienation and Violence as Themes in African American and Jamaican Cultural Texts. And today she's given us excerpts of her dissertation and she will focus on two movies, The Harder They Come, a brilliant movie which a lot of people might know, and a movie, Shotters, which is like a gangster, Batman, hardcore movie. She will compare the figure of the root boy to today's Shotters. She will talk where violence is coming from. And we also invited Kimani Mali, who promised that he would come, who promised he would be here at five, but he is an artist, and you always have to wait for artists. So I hope that he will come at six, as he said now he's going to do. And after Marlene's part, I'm very happy to introduce Sarah Bentley, who is sitting next to me, who is a journalist, a well-known journalist from, from England, who also writes a lot of really wonderful stories for Rhythm Magazine. And she did just wrote a piece on the Trenchtown Reading Center, which will be in the next issue. And when I read it, I thought, oh, Sarah, you definitely have to come and do something. I know she will be at the Rotterdam. And I thought, Sarah, this is a positive ghetto story. And talking only about violence, you know, I don't want to leave you here and thinking, oh gosh, Jamaica is just a place about violence. Jamaica is a beautiful and rich culture. And I want to also, we want to give you like a positive ghetto experience. And yes, I want to pass on to Marlene. I'm really happy, you know, <laughs> that we have you here. Thanks a lot. Hello? You hear me? I don't have any problem. <laughs> all right, everybody can hear me now, right? All right. I'm going to just start out with Mavado. Let me hear Mavado. This CD is rated G for Gangster. Its audio contains graphic lyrics, manifested and inspired by authentic ghetto experiences, served with infectious melodies. Listening discretion is advised. Welcome to the Symphony of David Brooks.
choose to start with Movado. I think Movado is uh, at the moment in Jamaica is getting a lot of uh, problems or a lot of hype about his, li his violent lyrics. And I would just like to say Movado is unfortunately a product of Jamaica. And what I'm going to try to do is try and explain how Movado came about and why, you know. But I'm going to basically start and with uh, Jamaica in the history of Jamaica. This will be my point trying to give you a background to Jamaica and sort of bring you into, bring you up to Mavado, but sort of show you how Mavado came about. I don't know if it will work, but I'll try. Background of Jamaican history. In my presentation, I will focus on the history of violence in Jamaican society, demonstrating that violence has been a part of the economic, political, and social structures of the island since Christopher Columbus came upon the island in 1492. When Christopher Col Columbus came on the island, it was populated by Amerindians from South America, known as Arawaks and Caribs. By 1611, only 74 of the approximately 60,000 Indians remain. The Spanish managed to wipe out the entire native population in less than a, in less than 100 years. The Spaniards murdered the native people, burning and roasting them alive, throwing them to wild dogs. The genocide crimes that the Spanish committed and refined in Jamaica and the native people will be continued in other forms by the British against the imported Africans later and will aim in forming the foundation of Jamaican history as we know it today. In 1655, Jamaica was seized by the British troops after their failure to capture Santo Domingo. Five years later, the Spanish withdraw from Jamaica, leaving the British, leaving African slaves to fight with the British. In 1655, Jamaica was, sorry, to fight by the Africans. These Africans were known as Maroons. Maroon is the term used to describe Afri runaway African slaves. The British started a civil government in Jamaica in 1663. Seventeen, seven years later, the British, planters, the British planters started commercial production of sugar. With the establishment of the sugar production, the demand for workers, which meant African slaves or Africans, who were forced to work as slaves. In 1658, there were 1,400 Africans on the island. By 1810, that's around 150 years later, the British imported 600 62,000 Africans to Jamaica. Over 70 years period, the British were first uh, forced to fight the Maroons, and this went on for 70 years. After 70 years, they were forced to form a peace treaty with the, with the Maroons. The brutality of the slave by the master and overseers in Jamaica was unfortunate in the norm. The usual punishment for slaves if they were catch after a rebellion was to burn them by nailing them down to the ground with sticks and applying the fire little by little up to their head. If they were caught running away, they would chop off their feet. The violent treatment of the slave by the British planters, which as I pointed above, was supported by the British political power government Jamaica at the time. African Jamaican history of violence has been used and continued to be used by the governing power to control and downpress the people of African descent. Today you can see this violence in the uh, Jamaican power structure in the form of pro police brutality, which I will get to later on. Jamaica has not only been violent, but the slaves have always used violence to free themselves. In 1831, one of the biggest rebellions took place in Jamaica. It helped to speed up the whole emancipation process. 
four years later on, the British were forced to abandon the whole slave trade in the Caribbean. In 1865, the first post-emancipation rebellion took place in Morant Bay, led by Paul Bogle. The root of the crisis was that even though the slave system was abolished, the whole political system and economic system was still based on the whole slave trade. Just to give you a background to Jamaica, now I come into the modern history of Jamaica, you might say. Violence on the formation of the Jamaican political parties. In 1838, oh, I'm sorry, the translators are complaining. I'm moving too fast. Sorry, sweetie. I'm, I go, I slow down, don't worry. You ready again? All right. In, 1930, in 1938, there were protests taking place in Jamaica and other West Indian societies. In Jamaica, the protests started in Frome, West Mullen, in the sugar refinery. This soon spread to the docks in Kingston. The high unemployment and general oppressive and poor living conditions all contributed to the protests. British-owned company Tate and Lloyd controlled the sugar industry, which they started to modernize, which meant machinery, and this cut their demands for workers. The workers in Form West Mullen started to set fire to the sugar refineries. But soon, it was not only the workers in the sugar refinery, you soon have the workers in Kingston on the docks joining all these protests. The Jamaican political parties, two, oh man, sorry. It is out of the workers' protest that the two men representing the workers formed the two Jamaican political parties, Alexander Bustamante, the Labour Party, or the Jamaican Labour Party, and his cousin formed the PMP, the People's National Party. The two parties created unions which were aligned with their, which were aligned with their parties. The JLP, its own, the Bustamante Trade Union, and the PMP, the Union Con uh, Trade Union Conference. It was in the two unions fight to represent the new mobilized urban workers which started the violence between the two political parties. Before the bosses would sit down, even at the bargaining table, the union had to bring in thugs to demonstrate their power. This is where a lot of the first gang violence began. The BITU controlled the docks, it does to this day. And the TUC, they fought, they fought back elsewhere in the sugar, uh, sugar factories, backside companies, and the, the trade building. Those, those were hard fights, and the strongest men carried the day. Just to make sure you understand what I'm saying. At the moment when the two political parties were formed, and along with their union, they used violence to get members. So you have a situation where you have a new history going now, the Jamaican history, 1938, the modern history, and you have violence, unfortunately, as a part of the structure. And then I move on. You with me? It's okay? All right. Then I move on now. Uh, how has Jamaican political system of clientelism uh, influenced violence in Jamaica? In 1962, Edward Siaga won his legislative uh, council seat for the GLP in West Kingston. Around the same time, he was named Minister of Welfare and Development. But according to Guns, in her text, Born for Death, he abused his position so much that some of the sufferers call him the Minister of Warfare and Development. In 1966, Siago started to clear the West Kinson shanty town of Baca Wall. It was an area well populated with PMP supporters, Rastafarians, and other urban sufferers. After Baca Wall was cleared, with the aid of bulldozer, police, tear gas, and rifles, Siaga started to build a housing project known as Tivoli Garden, where he rewarded his supporters with houses. From the PMP party, Dudley Thomas is credited as the man that took on Siago in the, seat, in the street of West Kingston and Central Kingston. Both Siaga and Thomas, according to Guns, 
muster small armies from the ranks of the neighborhood top gunmen. The PMP built the housing project on its gardens, otherwise known as not concrete jungle, after Siaga built Tivoli. By building housing projects for their party supporters, the politicians secure their powers in the Garrison community where a whole community vote for one single party. Supporters from oppositional party were either forced to leave the community or vote along community party line. The internal community affair were then controlled by the so-called community leaders most of these community leaders were top gunmen in the community who worked for the party. Whenever the oppositional party took, took power, the gunmen were able to receive visas where they migrated to the US. Or later, these same gangs would start to operate the drug trade, which gave them money and power. They soon become better equipped with guns than the Jamaican police force. Violence on the Jamaican police force. In Jamaica, the police has a paramilitary style of police. The police force originated during the harsh British post-emancipation period after the famous 1865 Morant Bay Rebellion led by Paul Bogle. From the beginning, the police force was fashioned as an instrument of domination. This explained the excessive use of violence by the Jamaican police force. The Jamaican police force has the highest murder rate in the world. Especially in the special units, which are, the, are on the front line, police brutality is instru institutionalized. But the fact that the police sometimes kill known criminal who has been terrorized the community, gave the, uh, give them support from the political administration and sometimes even, unfortunately, from the Jamaican population. The Jamaican police force is also politically corrupt. The political parties use the police force sometimes to secure and maintain political power in the form of election rigging, supplying ammunition to better protect party strongholder, murder or kill gunmen, gunmen that the police no longer find useful. And this is uh, where we will start with our film showing a part of the film. It's a little bit ahead or uh, uh, before what I want to talk about, but I just situate for you this scene. Here you have uh, Wayne Biggs. I don't, I don't know if anybody know the film, you know, so I'm just gonna uh, more or less explain. For those people who know the film, it might just be, I already know what she's talking. But uh, Wayne, he works for the politician, Mr. Anderson. And Mr. Anderson wants Wayne now to go to the States and cool out. Wayne decides he's not going to. So let's see what happens. Yeah, run the film. The band-aid, I need to cover it up. And underneath, it's still festering, still getting infected. All he's doing right now is trying to just put a pacify the situation, put a band-aid on the situation. He's not really doing anything to change it. I cannot afford to have any unnecessary wrongs in my constituency. You're going to have to work with me, William. So what do you want me to do for you now, sir? As you know, I have a very good connection at the embassy. I need you to leave to me. Well, my technicians or the technical problem here, but Basically, I wanted to show you where the politician ordered Wayne and his Wayne killed. And the person we ordered to kill Wayne is the police. So I thought this would be a good example that you see, I'm not just talking over my head, but to show you how does the film shatter, sort of capture certain Jamaican re All right. I will get Look at Biggs. Biggs like that. Biggs like that. Leave the island and go cool out for a while. Because I can't Biggs love that. You want to leave Jamaica like yesterday. I have a whole community depending on me. Sandy, I hear you. I respect you. Know. But I don't have foreign thing right you now, Miss Sandy. Things are going good for me right now in Jamaica, you know. No. Pigs don't like that. Wayne, <laughs> there is nothing else on the table. Nothing else on the table, Miss Sandy. You have to say, 
You can't tell him for back up. You can't tell him for sit down. And this is where it really gets crazy because the truth is, the truth of the matter is, Wayne is not the real gangster here. The real gangster here is Mr. Andy. The real gangster is Mr. Andy because he has what Wayne doesn't have. He has the power. He has the police department behind him. You know? So this is a fight that Wayne really can't win. You know? And, and here he is. Call out the troops. Call out the troops. Not good. Detective, we both have a common problem. His name is Wayne. This scene coming up, man, this was like my favorite scene. We shot this scene in Waterhouse like around 4.30 in the morning. There was like 700 people on the set that morning. That's, I mean, they was out. Nobody sleep. Kids. This is, uh, unfortunately, we have the director's commented version. I didn't realize that this is what we're looking at. So I was very irritated. I hope you all was irritated too, thinking what is going on here. Uh, I just, thanks to Pete, he just explained it to me. That is not the, I didn't want to have the director's comment. I wanted to comment myself, but the director did it for me. So I think we could basically, you know, just, uh, it would just be another second. Let it run for one minute more. You will see what happened. Everybody. And this was one hell of a gun battle. It was my, you know, my most fun you know, part in the movie to shoot, you know. We had the radio station down there broadcasting live. The guys get on the radio, you know, entertaining, you know, singing on the air. It was fun, you know. Something that never happened in Waterhouse. The whole community, they love it. Okay, we could stop. My basic point now was to have... point out that the politician is able to control the gangsters as well as the police. As soon as Wayne is no longer useful for him, he could order the police to kill him. And that was the point why I wanted to show this film, this part of the film. Okay, uh, we could stop and I move on. The influence of American cinematic representation and violence in Jamaican gangs. And it was during the building of Tivoli Gardens in 1966 that the struggles between the unions, which soon spread to the street of Kingston, that the gangs had a chance to prove themselves in the street wars. According to Guns, by 1967, the gunmen who worked for the politician had become the new lords of the street, politely hailed as community leaders who could wage war and make peace. They called themselves the untouchable because they were beyond the law. The title of the untouchable was like some of the gang members' name they were taken directly from American movies. Elliot Ness, The Untouchable, Tel Aviv from the movie Exodus, The Vikings from Kirk Douglas. One of the leaders, The Vikings from The Viking, Dillinger, also took his name from his favorite American outlaw. In the film, The Harder They Come, we saw that Ivan, the rude boy, posing with his guns in different Western movie style genre. I wanted now to show you a part from The Harder They Come. Let's see how, if it goes. Yeah? All right, I don't know, okay, uh, just to keep you, I don't know how many people have seen the harder they come, but as a Jamaican, I figure everybody here that is Jamaica interested or has to have seen the harder they come, come. You know, that was one of the reasons why I chose the movie because I thought at least this should be a movie that a lot of people have seen. And the movie was done in the late 60s, and at first it was banned. The Jamaican government didn't want the movie seen. It was first relief, released in 1972. And when it came out, it was really, it was a hit. And it has been for Jamaica, the first movie that was produced, directed in Jamaica. It was done with a Jamaican crew. So you could say this is where the Jamaican movie industry sort of started. And I wanted to basically point out how the whole American cinematic uh, ideals influenced Jamaica. And you will see how even the character, this is what I wanted to show now. Uh, that was what I wanted to show before <laughs> this whole scene where Ivan in his Western cl uh, clothes was like 
this, you know, really posing and really being the Western hero, you know, and I just thought that would be a scene where we could show everybody what I'm talking about, make it a bit real, more real, so it's not only me imagining things. this but it's just put it a little bit because you will see the scene where Ivan really pose let it run from here please it, I am afraid I am I must apologize that uh, with the technical yeah, things sir. are not going as I wish which time I let you off because this Plenty is time. a scene that I will come back to Plenty later times. on but, but you the remember the number of times you find yourself up in my yard when you don't want to go to the police station when you need help yes, sir. you remember the number of times I help you Hey? Yes, sir. This is the moment How where Detective you know Ray Jones start us proof to the criminals, and, and this I wanted Didn't to have later, but we, we, like we look at it now, because then I don't have to show this scene later you on, so. And some of you believe him can help you more than me? No, sir. Then why the backside you hiding him for? What is going on? You think him smarter than me because him have a hundred faces to hide and I can't find him? It's not because I'm smart I can't find him. It's because you're all foolish. You know, I believe because I'm so busy chasing Ivan now, I forget about you. But I stop chasing Ivan now. I go and start chasing you, all of you. And as of this week, no more gangs are coming into this town, you hear me? Not a stick, not a split, not even a puff. I'm going to starve you. Let me see how much you love Ivan when your belly empty. This is basically the scene that I wanted to show you. You see, Ivan, now he sees himself as a Western hero in a sense, you know, with his two gun, his whole, the whole clothes, the way he sees himself, you know, cut place. You know, this was basically the whole, what I wanted to show you this moment. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, you saw another part, another scene, and it's going to make my talk a little bit confusing, where the police, uh, um, Detective Dre Jones before, he, he already knows that he could really get the people to sell each other. In a moment where you're hungry, you're not loyal to anybody but your own stomach, and he's aware of that. Uh, what is your problem, baby? Too fast, too slow. It's all right, all right. But this is uh, where you saw before the scene where you know if you're hungry, you're not very loyal to anybody but your own stomach. And he's aware of this. And he also able to use the traders against each other. But this was a scene that I wanted to come back to. My main focus was at the moment the cinematic uh, influence of the American and the Jamaican uh, whole thing. Uh, I wanted to to describe or just define two concepts or three concepts for you, the rude boy, the shatter, and the deportee. Because these are things, uh, as far as the, the harder they come, this is a film that deals with the rude boy. The Ivan is the rude boy. And the concept of the rude boy could be defined as a rebellious youth movement that erupted in Jamaica in the early 1960s among the urban unemployed. They were strongly influenced by the Rastafarian notion of black emancipation and American cultural exports, the Western film, modeling themselves on an outlaw gangs. Their favorite weapons were the German ratchet knives and the handguns. The shutter, shutter is the Jamaican Creole word for shooter. And when we get to the movie again, shutter, then you will see what I'm talking, the shutter, Shutter is basically a gunman. It could be controlled by a don, which is uh, sometimes the community leader, or a shutter could just be uh, a gunman that operates independently. And normally you put the top to, the, to make, you know, to show how somebody is good, whether they're good or bad. And in the film Shutter, Mad Max is the top shutter, you know. And if you've seen the movie, all right, then you know what I'm talking about. And the concept of deportee, I deal with deportee because one of the main characters in the film Shutter, Biggs, he played play by Kaimani Mali, 
is a deportee. Wayne is also a deportee. A deportee in the Jamaican constant, these are Jamaicans that live abroad and get deported back to Jamaica because of illegal activities. It's mostly, unfortunately, drugs, but it could also be for other things. Once you're once you do something that the country, your host country, like let's say I'm living in Italy and I commit a crime or something, they will deport me back to Jamaica and then I am a deportee. So this is this concept and it plays a role in the film Shutter. I wanted to go back now from my basic concept why I wanted to show both films from Rude Boy to Shutter. I wanted to show how violence have changed in the Jamaican cultural expression. If you look at both films, the harder they come and shatter, you will see there's a difference. You know, the harder they come, I, like I point out to you before, it was the first film to be done by Jamaicans. The main story is a Jamaican story of a country boy coming to town looking for wealth and stardom, but instead he's robbed and confronted with the exploit exploitive strategies of urban survival by getting to know, to know Jose, a young, a young hustler. After his first night in the city, Jose wakes up to find himself penniless. He suffers from hunger and other basic human needs. And I wanted to now to go back to the beginning of the film, beginning of the film, to the third minute, uh, uh, three. One minute, just bear with me. This is what I need now. The very beginning. Uh, I wanted to show you the, how Ivan came about. Because basically when you see Ivan, move on just a little bit more faster, please. Listen fast, I don't want this part, I want the... Uh, yeah. We just wait for a second. More you, man. More up, wait a minute, man. You know the way to milk clean? You have money. If you have money, you go anywhere, you know. If you have money, you fast. I bet you stay warm. All right, then, how much? Give me 50 cents out, my food. Forward and fire. It's unfortunate, uh, but it doesn't True. make sense to show you. I, my basic point was to show you how Ivan, in the he comes to the city first, and he the first night out, he met this hustler, Jose. No, no, keep going. Jose started to take him to the firm Rialto. And afterwards, he wakes up the next morning uh, and finds himself basically penniless in the city. And it's more or less the country boy trying to survive in the, in the city. This is a scene right now. It's too early. This is a scene where he, he meets his mother after a very long time. They don't see each other. But I get you, but the telegram came back. And when she went to marry? Very early now. 5.36, okay, then, then fast forward. Mary this is Mary where Mary Ivan Mary comes and sees his mother, and his mother told him to go back to the city, go back to the country, because there's nothing he can uh, accomplish here in the city, you know. I am afraid the whole technical moment is not happening the way it should be happening. I'm sorry, and I, you know, because this is not basically the point. Let's stop. I keep going without the. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I keep going without the film. Going without. After Ivan is taken, um, after Ivan suffer, he end up at the preacher's house. And after he went, he end up at the preacher's house. I would just have to tell you the story for myself. Yeah, maybe later on somebody would be interested then in looking at the film. But after he ends up at the city, he ends up at preacher's house. Then preacher decided to take him in, but after a while he decided he cannot, you know, preacher throw him out. And this is where Ivan basically turned violent, cutting longer and all this. After he stabs, like slashing him in the face and always, he's, pol he's uh, punished by the police or by the, the system. And Ivan basically, after he's been punished, he turned to the drug trade, the ganja trade and then the police tried to arrest him and he remember basically the violence that he suffers at the hands of the police and then decide to start shooting. He kills the police in the end, he kills three police. You know, this is more or less his development into a rude boy in, in the sense. 
Okay, um, I don't know if it makes sense to deal with the whole film technical moment. Because I wanted also to, pr to show you the way Haven is at the beginning of the film, is outside, begging outside of a hotel, begging a guest uh, money. But once he has the gun in his hand, he doesn't beg anymore. He forces everybody. Everybody come out. He's come out. You know, he's, he's in a commanding position later on. Once he has a gun in his hand, compare without the gun. And I thought that might be a nice thing to show. But okay, we 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 go on. What you have, uh, what my basic thing here, what you have with both films, Ivan is being raised by his grandmother in the country. You also have Biggs in Shutter. He's being raised by his auntie in Kingston. Wayne doesn't know who his father is. And because of the Jamaican economic situation, you have a lot of broken family situation. Parents leaving for the States. Their children are left with a family member uh, or something like that. So you have these broken fami family structures that I personally think sometimes also is a contributing factor to the whole violence. You have children growing up not knowing who their parents are. So that, I think, also sometimes leads to this sort of uh, displaced family situation. Sometimes also leads to violence and, and alienation because people growing up without knowing your parents, you don't really know your identities too. So this is a, a chronic situation. You have it in Jamaica. And for the EU, I find it very interesting because you're having the same problem now in Poland. You have a lot of Polish people going to Ireland to work, and you have children, teenagers, or ch children growing up in Poland without their parents. So this is something uh, that not only touched Jamaica, it touched a lot of people where you have this migration culture, people going from places to places to look for work. You know, Poland is not Jamaica, but just to make the connection about this whole migrating family structures, what this, what, you know, and in the Polish situation, the, the amount of suicide, the suicide rate have increased because of, uh, and a lot of sociologists are blaming this and this moment, you know, just to connect Jamaica and this whole global culture of migration workers, you know, there's definitely effects. Okay, then let me try to go back now to the, <laughs> let me try to go back now to the film. Maybe we could get some scene going. I wanted to point out that in Jamaica, you have also, unfortunately, a glorification of violence. And I wanted to show a scene. It's the 117 minutes into the film. And I wanted to show from the harder they come, one hour and 17 minutes into the harder they come. And this was a scene, I don't know if we will ever get to it, but it's a scene where the photographer comes into the studio after Hive and hold up his colleague and force him to take pictures. And this uh, man wants to have an autogram of this, uh, of, of Ivan, you know, where I would really like the film to talk to for itself at this show. moment. I, I hope I didn't make any mistake with writing off the time, but it should be 117 minutes. Uh, yeah, that should be what I'm looking for, and I hope it is. This is Ivan. The whole body's dancing to his film, to his song, you know. This is also the whole uh, glorification of Ivan. The police is looking for him everywhere, and they cannot find him. And his music. The, this is a music producer, uh, Hamilton. He's coming to the police before you string him up and kill him. Let me get him to cut a few more songs for me, you know. And, you know, this is also, I think, very the exploitive quality also of the music industry that goes on. He's not interested in him as an artist before, but as Ivan became an outlaw, he suddenly wants to have him. You know, this is Ivan in the hotel, you know. Before, at the beginning of the film, you would see him outside the hotel begging for, uh, guests for pennies. He's not begging anybody anything anymore, you know, he's in command. And it is unfortunate that I in Jamaican society that with a gun, certain section of people get attention. You know, and it's, you, don't have, you don't have to idealize the whole thing, it's just unfortunately a reality. You know, before he was on the street begging, but now he's not begging. You know, and 
this is just for me as a Jamaican. Some of the some of the things that we have to really examine as a Jamaican, the effect and what does violence get you. So you can't really just pretend it's just alone violence, but sometimes you only that's the only way you get a certain amount of attention, which makes it for us as a country unfortunately not so not so good. You know. All right, I move on. <laughs> it's all right. Don't worry. Yeah, it's all right. We, we move on from the scene. I think I already explained to everybody. There was also this scene at the end of the film where Ivan chased Jose out of the, out of the village or out of the ghetto where it comes from. And you have all these children running behind Ivan. And really, you could see already, this is somebody that they're going to look up to later on, even though it's a, it's a cinematic fiction that is going on. Or, you know, but at the same time, you see the influence, basically, of the, of the violence and also at the younger generation. All right, I go back to Shutters now. Um, according to the director, uh, the film Shutter exposed life and corruption of the, political, of, of the politics in Jamaica. It is a true story from more than one Jamaican it is a project that exposed Jamaican lifestyle and lack of chances for poor Jamaicans. The people of Waterhouse wanted the film made, but the establishment did not want it. This could be read as a lack of power or separation of the inner city community of Waterhouse from the official power structure of the government, an alternative society with different rules than the official code of behavior set down by law. In the film, Biggs, the character who's deported back to Jamaica after 20 years, is surprised at the naked violence of Wayne and his gang after they murdered a car dealer who had not paid the extortion money demanded of him by the gang for protection service. And uh, we, tr we try again with the film shot uh, 24, at the 24 minutes. It's a mess. All right. I am... No, well, if it's a mess, we leave it. I'll just do the talk without the film. I'm very sorry, because a lot of what I... I want the 24 minute and 50 second. This was a scene where I wanted to show you that uh, how the, the naked violence that goes on with the gang sometimes. This man is a businessman. He's supposed to pay his money, he didn't pay, and they just sort of cold-blooded shoot him up, middle, you know. And big he's coming... 24 and 52. I, it's, we, we, I keep going. Maybe the film will come, maybe it's not. Uh, the character of Big is still framing the rude boy tradition. As, as Big's point out to Wayne, shatters don't kill nine to five people. He wants... All ah, right, all right, all right. Yeah, and we wanted to, yeah, one, wait, wait, okay, I wait, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, we wait, okay, Probably all very over the nice. World. Poly, no, no, really, no crimes can't really be committed freely without having, like, politicians involved. You know, to a certain degree, the politicians are the biggest criminals there are, you know, so, you know, we just touch on that. Or they use these type of guys to do their dirty this work. This is the work. guy. He doesn't pay for three months the money that the Wayne and the gang want. And this is what happened to him. Nene, close your eyes, please. solidify his position right now as a real killer right here. And now is where Biggs come and let the film run because Biggs, he hasn't been in Jamaica for 20 years and he's just shocked. This is where you go. Is this the way you are living? And you see it's this? just laugh about it. Ain't nothing but a thing. Not a day on the job. Welcome home, Biggs. 
<laughs> Welcome to Jam Rock. So this is uh, this is the start of a moment, and what the gang will do in the end, as Bigs point out, they want to go back to America where they could uh, uh, get some of the drug dealers' money that is going on in uh, Miami, and they will leave the island uh, after a while in the film for Miami. Cut, please. I think um, my point is when one examines the film Shutter, the three main characters, Wayne, Biggs, and Max, one can see that even though all three characters are violent, I am claiming that there are three different levels of violent representation of in the film. Biggs would like to just rob criminals like himself, Wayne rob anyone, and Mad Max is really mad. He's a brutal serial killer. One of the way you would say in Jamaica is just mad, sick, head, no good. One of the main difference between Ivan and Wayne is Ivan tried to find work of some kind before he turned to violence. It, was the it is the failure of the Jamaican society to, to offer Ivan a way of making a living that set him on the way to a life of outlaw. But whereas with Biggs and Wayne, they already started their criminal career as children. They already figured out that a gun can make them rich in Jamaican society and later in the US. Their hero is Sano, the gunman, Biggs and Wayne turned to crime directly in their youthful days. This could be seen as an indication as how far Jamaica has come, that people don't grow up anymore to turn criminal, but they started as children. Thank you. I am really sorry about the technical moment. It's out. All right, it's on. You want to come? I'm not sure, you know, um, maybe if somebody has question, first I want to say thank you. It was an excellent presentation, really a whole history and a lot of things where we all, I think, would have to think about later on still. I'm not sure if somebody has like a question directly before he, f he or she forgets it, you know, just let me know, put up your hand and I'll put Give the mic around. So okay, everybody needs, you know, to settle the whole information <laughs> before the questions come up. Then I would pass the microphone on to Sarah Bentley. As I said before, she's given us a positive ghetto story. She's talking about the Trench Town Reading Center and what it is all about, Sarah. Hi, so um, just a bit more background. I'm a music journalist based in London. Um, I travel quite often to Jamaica, but also to other countries like Nigeria, Cuba, Puerto Rico. Um, what you see when you travel to these communities is you often hear about the violence, you hear about you know, the divisions, you hear about everything that's negative. Yet, from my experience, I can say that you normally come across more kind, you know, kind people, a uh, greater sense of community in these kind of areas that are supposedly racked with trouble. You actually encounter some of the best things of mankind in these communities as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you uh, a story about the Trenchtown Reading Centre. This is a centre that was set up in 1993 in the middle of Trenchtown. It's a library and it was set up by a Canadian woman called Rosalind Ellison. Um, Rhythm magazine actually published the story. They're going to publish it next month. So I'm going to read like a shortened version of it to you today and hopefully you'll get an alternative view of some of the really amazing things that do come out of areas like Tivoli Gardens, like Trenchtown, of these parts of Jamaica that we've just been talking about. Okay. So it's break time at the Trenchtown Reading Center and the place fizzes with energy and enterprise. Inside its canary yellow walls, kids tear about, excitedly pulling books from shelves. A little boy has been sent out to the veranda, no eating in the classroom, where he sucks on a mango, oblivious to the soppy orange fibers covering his face as he eyes a couple of ewes who've been set to work planting a flower garden. Such a concession to environment is alien to most Trenchtown residents. Two little girls, no more... 
or slower, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Two little girls, no more than four years old, are coming to blows over a sea life book. Hands on hips, they state their claim to the tomb in a heated exchange of thick patois, like a pair of vexed teenagers arguing over a boy. Before the duo come to blows, Happy, the center's librarian and teacher, interjects with a few attention-grabbing hand claps. The kids obediently melt into a cross-legged position on the floor. As she commences reading, the tussling mini divas listen intently with their arms wrapped around each other. The sea life beef is already forgotten. If only all of the community's conflicts could be solved so easily. The Trenchtown Reading Center is an oasis of progress, positivity, and peace in one of Jamaica's most tumultuous communities. Here, gun battles are so frequent, only the most fervent hit Jamaican newspapers, the most recent being in May 2008, when two policemen patrolling the area on foot were shot dead. Although known as a birthplace of reggae and a place where legend Bob Marley lived in a government yard, its reputation for lawlessness, gang warfare, extreme poverty, and deadly political divisions has long transplanted any romanticized notions of ghetto life. Although such negatives cannot be refuted, there is another part of the saga that rarely gets told, a tale of friendship, pride, resilience, compassion, humanity, and from both outsiders and, res and residents, dogged determination for progress and change. Since 1993, the Trenchtown Reading Center has been an ongoing chapter in that story. Located on First Street, across the road from the Bob Marley Culture Yard and a food hut that serves the cheapest idle food in Kingston, the Trenchtown Reading Center is a library, school, and community cornerstone, a place where, in the words of founder Rosalind Ellison, life is enriched by reading and learning. Over the years, the center has been a hub of activities, including adult literacy classes, reading, conflict management seminars, art workshops, and black history lessons. Although initiated by a group, including Trenchtown residents, Michael Rose, Vigo Dennis, uh, Vigo, Dennis James, and Vincent Graham, the latter two men sadly lost to community conflict. It's Canadian national, Rosalind Ellison, that's been the sole consistent driving force behind the center from inception to present day. Understandably, many locals were suspicious as to why a white Canadian woman would waltz into Trenchtown and become so involved. Yet over the years, she has won their trust and respect. Through a combination of generosity, door opening, and tough love, She's brought lunches for hungry people, put orphaned kids through school, given loans to women to buy water coolers to start roadside stalls selling box juice, and employed local men to paint and build. No one wants to be dependent, she says. Most people would rather work, but sometimes you need a leg up. Also, I'm not sympathetic to those who waste chances. If I lend money for someone to do something constructive with, and they waste it, I blow my stack. It's not fair. That's taking an opportunity away from someone else that would have used it properly. Yeah. Yeah. You missed some? Okay, I'm going to repeat the last three lines. You missed, you missed some? Okay. Uh, most people would rather work, but s sometimes you need a leg up. Also, I'm not as sympathetic to those who waste chances. If I lend money for someone to do something constructive with and they waste it, I blow my stack. It's not fair. That's taking an opportunity away from someone else who would have used it properly. Okay. What's special about the Trenchtown Reading Center is that it has no hidden agenda. Unlike many of Kingston's youth projects, its books and programming are strictly secular, so that's non-religion based. A lot of youth projects in Jamaica are supported and funded by the church, and so there's actually an agenda to the improvement. Uh, we don't want souls, says Ellison, just focused brains. Because the bulk of the funding has come from abroad, 
either personally from Ellison or via the Friends of the Trenchtown Reading Centre, an NGO she set up in her hometown of Vancouver, no one Jamaican political party can lay claim to it. Therefore, the centre is a neutral space and that has remained open even when schools and public transport links have closed during intense periods of violence. Apart from a one-off investigative visit from a gun-toting police force, it is yet to bear witness to any major altercation. Another facet of the centre's uniqueness is its quality. Unlike Kingston's main public library, where the children's section is notably outdated and full of pictures of white children, the books at the Trenchtown Reading Centre are contemporary and selected to ignite pride in Caribbean adults and children. Volumes on Rastafari, Marcus Garvey, African history and reggae sit close to brightly illustrated children's tombs about Caribbean poetry, wildlife, flowers and fauna with images the children can relate to and be inspired by. Accompanying this impeccable catalogue the centre has electric fans, comfortable chairs, freshly painted walls and a newly planted flower garden. Luxuries which Roslyn has often been challenged about. The amount of times I've heard, fans, what do people in Trenchtown want fans for? As if, if you live in Trenchtown, you, you wouldn't possibly want an electric fan while you're learning because that's the mentality that is often generated in Jamaica, that if people live in these communities, they don't need certain things. For both adults who've slipped through the educational net, 21% of the population in Jamaica are actually illiterate. And people on lo and low income parents, the Trenchtown Reading Centre is a much welcome anom anomaly. At all ages, education in Jamaica has to be paid for. Preparatory schools charge fees between 450 Jamaican dollars and 2,500 Jamaican dollars per term. So this figure, and that, sorry, and this figure does not include books, school uniform, bus fare, and lunch. So this is just for the schooling. Minimum wage in Jamaica has recently been raised to 3,700 Jamaican dollars, which is a really nominal fee. Uh, the kind of sums needed for education are out of reach for a vast majority and consequently children from low income families have very sporadic education where they're sent to school when the guardians can afford it and kept at home when the guardians can't afford it. Appalling living conditions have been part of the warp and weft of Trenchtown ever since it became a residential neighbourhood. Post-1870, a period of mass emigration ensued, so like what we saw in the video with Ivan coming from the country to Kingston, with Kingston's population mushrooming by 300% by 1938. For decades, the then British-ruled government failed to engage in any kind of urban planning. So Kingston's burgeoning new population was abandoned to their wits and ingenuity alone to survive. Many set up home in the squatter camps of Trenchtown and nearby Dungle, a slum on a garbage site on a waterfront of downtown Kingston. Between 1945 and 1951, Trenchtown was redeveloped. And I say redeveloped in inverted commas because the redevelopment came in the form of tenement yards. Um, now you've probably heard of tenement yards in so many reggae lyrics. Um, what these actually are, I don't know if you've seen them, but they're um, a, a yard with singular rooms in a square formation. And in the middle of the square formation, you have a yard with a standpipe and communal cooking facilities. In these yards, you could have up to 10 families. It's so one family per room. So they're literally jammed with people. And this was the uh, redevelopment that the British government gave, gave to Trenchtown. Um, at the Culture Yard site, which is um, a site over the road from Trenchtown where Bob Marley lived, he has his own four by seven foot room. So a really small room, if you imagine, four by seven foot. And that was his own room, so he was quite lucky. He didn't have a family, whole family living in there. 
But those rooms, a lot of them remain that size today with whole families living in them. A tenement yards shake to a relentless 24-7 soundtrack of life. A hungry belly picnic cry, frustrated baby mother's wail, ancient beds creak under vigorously copulating couples, goats bleat and chickens cluck, grannies wash, scrub and beat. Late night visitors issue thundering knocks and psss, dance hall pumps, youths sing, police raid. Arguments erupt over anything. A stolen cigarette, an unwashed pot, a minor disrespect. This incessant cacophony explains why so many ghetto youths spend their lives deep on the road, so on the road, out on the street. Their homes affording them little space to breathe, never mind a place to study. Despite the recent police slayings, the current vibe in Trenchtown is peaceful. Children play on the street, the schools and shops are open, and people go about their business with a sauntering determination. Things could change at any time, though, and the community lives on a knife edge. Everyone has lost loved ones to gang violence. Everyone has been caught in the crossfire and has tales of dodging bullets by cowering behind walls or dragging themselves along the ground commando style. Now that's everyone who lives in Trenchtown has this experience. Not a few people, absolutely every single person that lives there. The same tots that you now innocently see playing tag on the street, they know the most sophisticated weapons, they know the names of the most sophisticated weapons of street warfare and can identify the different guns, the M1 Enforcer, the Thompson, the Israeli Uzi, simply by listening to the shots as they lie in bed awake at night. All too easily, these children could fall into the kind of lives led by Trenchtown gangs, such as the Fatherless Crew, the Lock the City Crew, and the Action Pack Posse. Statistics say 90% of murders are committed by boys aged between 18 to 30 years old, 86% of which are illiterate and fatherless. So much more than a library, the Trenchtown Reading Center is on the front line of life path intervention. The Trenchtown Reading Center was the result of a reasoning session in the then underdeveloped Bob Marley Culture Yard. Roslyn Ellison was visiting Kingston and had been dropped off at First Street by a Jamaican who she'd been touring with and he told her the imitable phrase, me soon come. She had no idea why he dropped her there. She thinks perhaps he needed to borrow the car, but there she was, and fortunately for the community, that was the case, and um, the conversation she had resulted in the idea for the Trenchtown Reading Center. Unlike many well-meaning foreign altruists, Ellison put her money and time where her mouth was and five weeks after this initial discussion in Trenchtown, with a team of dedicated community members, the center opened with an official ribbon cutting ceremony. Now anyone that's been to Jamaica or tried to do anything in Jamaica will realize that is nothing short of a miracle, an idea happening for a library and five weeks later, the library's open. That is pretty much unheard of there, so pretty special. Um, other than dig three holes in the run-up to the 1997 election, the government provided no assistance to the centre at all until 1998, when after much lobbying, a new structure was built. Ellison is hugely diplomatic about this development, praising the structure's various uses, such as fitness, uh, concerts or lunch, but the building actually had no walls. So no walls at all, it was just a roof. And um, this is a structure that the Jamaican government provided for children living in a violent, ravaged area to, to learn in. Two, four stilts with a roof, no walls. So you can see how kind of challenging it is trying to do anything, trying to do anything there. So from 2000 to 2005, Ellison, she took a five-year sabbatical from Jamaica to nurse her elderly parents. 
When she returned in 2005, the center had fallen into disarray. Ziggy was gone. He was the guy that originally ran the center for her. And Massive Dread and Chubby had been killed in community warfare. Again, two very key people in the team when it started. The entire book collection had disappeared, as had the furniture, and any materials that can be ripped from the structure had been stolen. So at this point, many would have given up and come to the, come to the decision that the community didn't want a library. But fortunately, Ellison didn't. And within weeks, she'd got community leaders on side. And when we say community leaders, we mean dons. We don't mean officials. We don't mean politicians. We mean dons. And within a few weeks, um, they'd moved the library back in and they'd relaunched the center. One of the members of, his, of this team was Keisha Harrell. And her name's Happy. And she's a young woman who, age 10, had helped unpack the first banana crate of books. And Ellison now employs her as a full-time librarian and teacher. Okay. Uh, Rosalind Ellison, as you can imagine, is a tough, plain-talking, no-nonsense woman. And she's needed to be to keep the center running and let the torrent of undercurrents wash over her, wash over her head over the years. Fully aware of the potential reprisals from within the community and the authorities, she diplomatically uses the phrase undercurrents to refer to the problems such as the gangs, the wayward dons, the unscrupulous politicians, the pseudo-do-gooders that have a stranglehold on the area and prevent it from progressing. I put my head down and do the work, she says. If you get bogged down with personal politics and the PhD mentality, which stands for pull him down, it's a phrase they use in Trenchtown for the idea of whenever anyone is doing well, you try and pull them down and bring them back to your level. And, and it drains you of energy, she says. Despite the constant struggles and suspicion, because I'm not doing anything for the money or for Jesus, People presume there must be a secret agenda to the Trenchtown Reading Center. But she never regrets the immense amount of time and personal finance she has put into the project. I don't ski, she laughs. I do this instead. Today, the center is testament to what can be achieved in even the most complicated circumstances. There's a full program of classes and activities frequent community concerts and events such as a hotly contested spelling bee, a graduates, and there's a graduates list of kids and adults who've made startling achievements such as learning to write for the first time aged 46. With things going so well at the center, although the search for funding and for new books is never ending, what's the next big challenge for the center? Persuading people of the benefits is an ongoing battle, says Ellison. There isn't the focus on books like there once was. Everyone wants to watch TV and send text messages. So what's the battle plan for the center tackling this? As it's a Jamaican way, we're reaching people through music, says Ellison. We hold free concerts near the school, hosted by our supporters at Roots FM, and I steam around telling everyone about the center. Music unites and builds bridges. Books give knowledge, and with knowledge comes power. And the community needs both. Music and books, it's a sweet connection. So that's the end of the article. It's quite long, so thank you for <laughs> bearing with it all. But if you want to get involved with the Trenchtown Reading Center, you can do it really, really easily. The website is trenchtownreadingcenter.com. You can donate money to it. You can become a friend of the center. You can even go to Jamaica and teach there for a few weeks if you so want to. It's a really inspiring story, and it's right in the center of the community where reggae comes from. So everyone that's got anything from reggae, their lifestyle, their music choice, I think it's really nice if you can give some time to give something back to that. So if you could look at the website, that would be great. Thank you.
Okay, we would like to do like a question and answer thing now. So whoever has a question, I can pass over the mic and we can discuss whatever is on your mind. Come on, people, you have to ask something. <laughs> oh, well, since Kimani Mali hasn't showed up as yet, um, if you don't have any, oh yeah, there's somebody have a question. I come over with the mic. Hello, my name is Diego, I came from Spain. I wondered, is there really a solution or it all passes by first uh, trying to fix the politics? Well, I, I would personally say that the whole political, uh, political landscape has to change because I think basically we have to change. <laughs> I don't think it's a matter of whether we want to or not. I don't think Jamaica can continue like that. So I think it has to be a change. You know, I think once you get to the point 200 murders in one month, I don't think we can do anything. But I think basically what you said too, the, it has to be a change coming from top, not from bottom, you know, because I think that has, we have seen, for me, it's very frustrating to see that every time the Jamaican people try to rebel or try to form something new, it has always been hijacked by the politicians in a sense. In 1938 uh, uprising, they were hijacked with the formation of the politics. Then you have it again in the mid 60s being hijacked again. So I think uh, the Jamaican history have proven that the people are willing to change their circumstances. I just think we start having a lot of problems as soon as we get to the political involvement, pe the politics trying to help us, you know. That is what I would say. But also what you have to remember today is that it is not 1981 anymore. A lot of the gangs that exist in Jamaica exist independently of any politician and any political group. They're more concerned with drug dealing, hustling arms, controlling turf, controlling spots. Of course, there are gangs still affiliated to politicians. There are. But at the same time, if the gangs can be taken into another sort of employment and have their lives redirected as children into something more positive, then the community can improve because the, the structure of gangs now is very much the dons ruling the gangs are in charge. Politics do not have as big a sway, it's still involved, but not as big as before. And this is proof in the election that went last year Eight people died on the campaign trail. Eight. In 81, 800 people died on the campaign trail. So you can see the development and the progression that, of course, the gangs and the violence is linked to politics, but more people have died fighting over turf in downtown Kingston than in the whole of last year's campaign. So things are changing, so the gangs have to be dissolved and a lot of preventative measures have to come from the government and from schools to stop mainly young Jamaican men getting involved with gang life. So it's definitely possible, yeah. I think you had a question. Uh, did you have a question? No? <laughs> So a question for Sarah about being uh, a white European people and uh, going into the ghetto in Jamaica. So I know it's very hard and you spent a lot of time in Trenchtown and so you did experience the, the ghetto reality. So what was your very first experience? Uh, did you have any har harassment or, or did you look for any protection by any don or any ex-policeman? I, I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't get protection from a don or the police <laughs> if I went to Trenchtown. Um, when you go to these kind of communities, normally if you're scared and if you feel uncomfortable, people smell you coming from two miles away and they sense the fear and they sense the alienation and they sense the prejudice that you're already entering into this community with these preconceived ideas of this is a downbeaten you know, community, it's very violent. 
and you forget that they're actually real people that get up every day and go to work and send their children to school and get ill and have grandparents and argue with their boyfriend and they're the same as all of us. And when you enter these communities with this kind of mentality, then you'll find the reception is much warmer. I would always recommend going as someone that knows the area or that lives in the area. And then you're going with them and that's like your endorsement that you're cool, you're okay. But if you go with a Don or you go with a policeman, then you're already drawing boundaries around yourself with what side you're on. So, you know, essentially you don't really want to be doing that as a foreigner. You want to go in neutral. And so just someone that lives in the area. Musicians are really good to enter certain communities with. Musicians and artists, generally. So basically you had links through musicians, like the getting interviews and asking about uh, how to go to Trench Town and see the reality. Not the first time. The first time I just went, but um, I wouldn't really recommend that. The second time we went with um, an artist called L.A. Lewis. He's a graffiti artist. He's, um, he calls himself a star, yet nobody knows his records. Yet his graffiti is really famous. It's all over Kingston. And he was the first person in Kingston to start graffiti tagging. Then he was doing it with a paint pot, and he would write L.A. Lewis, the, the big bad DJ, but he was doing it and he was pretending it was fan graffiti. So he's really, really famous in Kingston for this, for having this pseudo fan graffiti. And he used to have a car with a speaker strapped to the car with a rope, and he would drive around Kingston promoting his records that no one ever bought and no one ever listened to his show. And so I went to Trenchtown with him, and so that was, yeah, maybe a good entry point or a bad entry point, I'm not sure. I think it also depends on the time. You have to know when you can go to Trench Town or places like this, Tivoli Gardens, Arnett Gardens. Like, I was in February. Huh? I was in Trench Town in February. It was even night time and it was real easy to, to go there and people came up to us and asked us questions and were interested in what we were doing. And when we wanted to go back there in May, just a few days earlier, a policeman was killed and the situation was very tense, so we decided maybe we don't go there this time. Now what? Come to Trenchtown, Rima, Tivoli, Maxfield, Jungle, anywhere. The whole are all glad for soon. No? We sit down, we talk, we discuss how we can do for help the community. All heap of things, guys. Everything good to go. No matter the done, nobody. From when I come, everything will all right. Everything will good. Just need to get a group, come, and make a soon face. Make a soon we can do for help the youth them. Help some of the crime, some of the violence are, is it? And I come and everything will all right. No. Can you come and you know? And you see how the place is. Nobody not do you know. We're glad to see you be a happiness, or go no. No, we describe what we can do for help some of the crime, them car. All people say the thing, you know. I don't know, go and say no nothing, is it me? No violence to say that those people say the thing, you get me? Yeah? So don't know. Come on, Jamaica. <laughs> All right, yeah. Yeah, good thanks for the comment. Anybody else? Any questions, please? Okay, then I guess I just tell you about what's gonna happen here tomorrow. Um, we have the title of the session tomorrow is Unity and Diversity of a Global Philosophy, Rastafari. Werner Zips, who is a professor in Vienna, Austria, is going to do a talk. Um, and also we're going to have here Sidney Selman, who lives in Shashamani, the piece of land that Haile Selassie gave to the Rastas from Jamaica. He's going to talk about his experience. And then we have... Um, a representative from the Ethiopian Tourist Ministry. Her name is Lila Mercuria Worku, and 
She's also going to talk about Rasta in Africa, in Ethiopia. And I hope to see you all again tomorrow, uh, 5 o'clock. Thanks. Uh, one more little thing, you know, um, we want to give excuse for the non-presence of Kimani Mali. He is here now. Okay, so that, that, that means he's willing to come over and talk to the people. I'm very sorry, you know, I just heard that he is not going to take part. His management sent me quite some emails to confirm that he's going to take part, but as so it goes sometimes, as the Jamaican people say. Nevertheless, we hope to see you all tomorrow morning, and I hope you enjoyed the session, took enough knowledge with you. Give thanks. Thank you.